Welcome, Michael. As Tab mentioned, my name is Michael Todd. I am the marketing specialist for WNB Financial, and of course, we're all here tonight to learn about spreadsheets and overdraft protection, right? Huh. <laughs> yeah. well, of course, we're here to learn the story of WNB. So, um, while we are speaking tonight, if at any point um, something we say sparks a memory for you, please, I invite you to raise your hand. I would be more than happy to share the spotlight with you, although I deserve it, I'm beautiful. <laughs> I, would be, I would love to hear your story while I share our story. So, um, as well, you should have all found a postcard on your seat. Um, I am leading the charge in WNB to establish a proper historical archive. And amongst the things we have discovered are these postcards. These are the oldest postcards I was able to find in our storage, and I am very happy to be able to share this with my new friends. <laughs> so without any further ado, let's go ahead and hop into it. On April 15, 1874, seven founders met together to sign the Articles of Incorporation to create the Winona Savings Bank. One of the first savings banks in Minnesota. In fact, it was only 16 years old. Barely old enough to have a driver's license. I don't know what we were thinking giving these people a bank. <laughs> <laughs> the founders were Franklin A. Rising, Caleb J. Camp, William H. Laird, Earl S. Humans, William Mitchell, Thomas Wilson, and Herman E. Curtis. These were all renowned members of our local community. Many of them have, um, their historic homes are still preserved today in our various historic districts throughout town. The first president of the bank was William Mitchell, a renowned Minnesota Supreme Court judge and also the namesake of the William Mitchell College of Law. The following president was William Windham. If you can't tell, the bank is a big fan of Williams. <laughs> William Wyndham was a U.S. representative, a U.S. senator, and the U.S. Secretary of Treasury before being featured on the $2 bill. William Wyndham was followed by C.A. Morey, who was the principal and a board member of the State Normal School, which of course became the Winona State University. Maury was president of the bank when we were acquired by the Watkins Medical Company, and of course, J.R. Watkins became our next president. J.R. appointed Hannibal Choate. Hannibal was known as Winona's Merchant Prince. He was a well-respected and tremendously successful business owner and owned multiple department stores throughout our region. He is also the creator of the Choke Building on 3rd Street, where Heart's Desire is now located. After Hannibal came E.L. King. E.L. King was the son-in-law of J.R. Watkins. And under E.L. King served Paul Watkins, J.R.'s nephew. Vice versa for the Watkins Corporation, Paul Watkins was the president, while J.R. was the vice president. And this truly demonstrates how intertwined these two organizations came to be. In 1913, E.L. King commissioned renowned Chicago architect George Mayer to design a grand bank building with one wing dedicated to the Winona Savings Bank and the second wing for the newly formed commercial arm Winona National Bank. George Mayer was a renowned architect, friend, and co-worker of Frank Lloyd Wright. Frank is best known for his work, Falling Water. The two pioneered and helped popularize the Prairie School style of architecture. To this day, Prairie School architecture remains the most popular style of architecture throughout the Midwest. George designed countless landmarks throughout our region, including the Watkins Administration Building and the Rockledge Estate, where the King family resided. 
In 1914, just one year later, construction began on our historic downtown Winona office and was completed just two years later. This was a truly monumental achievement for the time, considering materials were sourced from all around the world. We have green Tinos marble from Greece, we have white veined marble from Italy, and we have two 37-foot tall, massive, single-piece granite columns standing atop a five-ton base totaling 32 tons each. These columns were quarried in North Carolina and polished in Vermont before being transported here to Winona. All of this was done without emails, <laughs> without cell phones, and certainly without e-signatures. But did you know there's buried treasure at the bank? There is a small copper box containing old bank photos, bank plans and schematics, and gold doubloons. <laughs> and this wonderful small copper, copper box, also known as a time capsule, is buried beneath 40 tons of granite <laughs> <laughs> under our south column. So there are no plans currently to retrieve this time capsule. But before any of this could be built, before the walls could be constructed, before the pillars could be hoisted into place, there is one particular item that needed to be set first. And that is our massive steel vault. In the early 1900s, there was no such thing as FDIC deposit insurance. So the people needed to be able to trust that their money, their belongings, their valuables were safe. So we built a massive vault, so big that there is not a door in our building we could ever hope to fit this out. So big that the door alone is 22 and a half tons. The vault was built by the Diebold Lock and Safe Company from Canton, Ohio, and is still serviced by them to this day. The vault remains in operation. We store our safe deposit boxes in there, as well as a few smaller safes, which keep items from our trust department, as well as the large canvas sacks of coins that come to us from our customers that own laundry mats or vending machines throughout the area. <laughs> the vault itself runs off a series of timers. There are four clocks, three of which are inside the door itself. One is central in the middle. You can't miss it. At 8 a.m., the vault is unlocked. And at 5 p.m., the vault is relocked. If you happen to be on the wrong side of this door <laughs> at 5 p.m., you will remain there until 8 a.m. There is no way for us to get in. There is, however, a beautiful tile floor. Each piece was placed individually. It's stunning. You gotta see it. But it can't imagine that it would be particularly comfortable to sleep on. Now this is when usually someone will ask, has anyone ever been locked in the vault? And the answer, not yet. <laughs> if someone were to be locked in the vault, there is of course a red landline telephone which you can call out to inform people that you are stuck, <laughs> to which they will reply, that's rough. <laughs> there is also a hatch, small handle. If you turn it, it will pump fresh air into the vault. You will be fine, but you will need to visit the chiropractor in the morning. <laughs> and once our vault was in place and our walls were constructed, it was time to make this place beautiful. Our building is designed in a combination of prairie style, architecture and Egyptian revival style. Prairie School of Architecture is characterized by long, 
um, elongated horizontal rectangles. And you see these all throughout the bank, from our ceilings to our floors, our walls, our chairs, our railings, even the ventilation grates themselves. These vast expanses are meant to relate to America's native prairies. Another characteristics, more characteristics of Prairie School architecture are open floor plans, horizontal lines, and indigenous materials such as those used in our mahogany chairs and railings. Egyptian revival style architecture is characterized by tall, ornate structures using organic shapes, in our case, lily pads and lily flowers. Additionally, there are a massive amount, over 50 decorative lion heads throughout the interior and exterior of the bank, most notably adorning our skylights and our main lobby, looking down upon the bank as if to say, Simba, everything the sun touches is our kingdom. <laughs> but of course, there is no better example of the perfect melding of these two styles of design than our beautiful stained glass windows. Our windows were produced by Tiffany Studios of New York, now known as Tiffany & Company, the diamond jewelry people, also the same people that make the Vince Lombardi trophy for the Super Bowl. <laughs> that one always gets the guys. <laughs> In 1915, Louis Comfort Tiffany premiered his techniques for creating opalescent stained glass at the Chicago World's Fair. In 1916, our windows were complete. The opalescent glass technique is in strong comparison or juxtaposition to the traditional, the then traditional technique of Gothic glass, which used regular clear glass, and painted enamel. These created very rich, very saturated colors, but they were often very solid colors. Opalescent glass is created using a technique of scraping various chemicals or frit into molten glass and allowing for a natural chemical reaction to take place, creating far more varied colors. So for example, you can see the variation in color on our vans here that are supposed to be gold, maybe you can't see, um, but it reaches, it ranges from greens to yellows to whites to reds, and the variation is particularly beautiful in our lily pads, where you see a much more organic shade of green than could be achieved with the traditional technique of Gothic glass. Louis Comfort Tiffany also premiered his technique for creating drapery glass, or ripple glass. This is a process where molten glass is passed through two steel rollers at varying speeds. The changes in speed cause bunching and stretching of the glass. This is a common technique used in churches to create the appearance of a flowing rope. But in our case, it was used in a much more subtle approach to create the appearance of flowing water. Every stained glass window is supposed to tell a story. Ours tells the story of the Mississippi River surrounding the city of Winona. You see the machined, precise geometric shapes in the center echoing those of Prairie School influence and that of a city surrounded by a deep blue rich channel of water. Floating atop this water are lily pads and lily flowers drawing a beautiful parallel to the Egyptian revival style of architecture. Now at this time, I would love to open it up to someone to take a guess, shot in the dark, how much do you think we paid for all of our stained glass windows combined? Somebody throw out a number. What year would that have been? 1916, they were completed, started in 1915. No, 50,000 50, less. 80,000 way less. 40. 20. 20? You're getting closer. 25. We paid 12,000. Wow. How many windows did 
windows. There are three main windows. So there is the central window, and then there are windows on either side of our lobbies. This also paid for our skylights and our lighting fixtures. What's truly incredible about this is that for over a hundred years, these light fixtures have been in continuous use and still to this day remain intact and undamaged. A fun story I would like to share with you. About 30 days before the opening, the grand opening of the bank, our shareholders took a nice stroll through, make sure that all of the checks, the box had been checked, they were um, approving designs, and they're walking to our grand entrance, and they look upon our monolithic vault and say, it's boring. <laughs> <laughs> and so we commissioned Tiffany Studios to produce this decorative frieze to go above the cove in our vault. <laughs> and they achieved this by referencing the sketches and designs of George Mayer and the influences of Egyptian Revival and Prairie School of Architecture. This frieze over our vault cost us $237. <laughs> you guys walk into Tiffany's sometime with 230 bucks in your pocket, you let me know what you can get. <laughs> so we talked briefly about E.L. King. I'd like to take a moment to talk about Grace. Grace was the, of course, the wife of E.L. King and the daughter of J.R. Watkins, but she was also, in her own right, a legendary trap shooter. She is a two-time American clay target champion in back-to-back -back years, first in Atlantic City in 1922, and then again in Chicago in 1923. She is an avid collector and amassed a massive amount of guns, 100 of which are on display in our bank today. The King family, like the rest of us, loved to go on vacation, and one of their favorite destinations to vacation was the African Safari. They took two trips to the African Safari. On their second trip, they specifically went to find lions, and lo and behold, they stumbled upon two abandoned baby lion cubs. And keeping with the times, they decided to scoop these lions up and they brought them back here to the States and raised them in a separate building on the Rockledge estate. There are stories to this day of children's birthday parties hosted in Rockledge, hearing the lions roar from the building. They of course kept a, um, a lion keeper on staff, I apologize, I don't have the correct term for that, um, until the lions were raised to maturity and they were donated to a local zoo. But of course, the King family would also take with them a member of the taxidermy group of James L. Clark. James L. Clark Studio is best known for their work taxidermying Teddy Roosevelt's elephants in the Natural History Museum of New York. The King family, of course, brought all of the animals that they uh, hunted in the African safari back here to our museum, where they remain and they, where they will stay. Our museum has been and will continue to be free and open to the public. In E.L. King's words himself, the purpose of this museum is to educate the young and delight the adults who would have otherwise no opportunity of seeing these beautiful animals in the wild. And Grace, committed to the same effort, published the first ever book on hunting big game in Africa to share their stories, their knowledge, and their experiences with the rest of our country. Keep in mind, this was a time predating National Geographic and the Discovery Channel. So the people <laughs> of Winona and the rest of our country had no other way of knowing what any of these animals looked like 
or even that they existed. A fun fact, the line that you see here is located above our teller line, but it is also <clears throat> the reference for which our gold lion statue on our monument sign was sculpted. The King family brought back a wide variety of animals, from impalas to leopards to lions, oh my. <laughs> Raise your hand if you remember touring the museum as a child. Me too. I remember touring the museum with the local YMCA as a student in summer escape. And then later, I became a counselor at that same YMCA myself, and I got to tour with the museum with all of my students. And now I am so incredibly grateful to stand before you today and to be able to share the incredible resource that is this museum with you all. And I absolutely invite you the next time that you're at the bank, there's a little ledge with some grass. It's super fun to try and just walk just like that. It's a really good time. <laughs> Camp counselors hate it though. But these animals have been preserved for over 100 years. And that is truly a testament to the work of the James L. Clark studio. But like all things, with age and with time, they have taken a toll on our animals. So about 10 years ago, for the first time in over 100 years, we opened the cases. And we hired a local taxidermist, an expert in this field, to help restore the animals. Most of the animals had eyes that had grown clouded over the years. We needed to polish those up. Our lion, of course, his hair went flat, so we busted out the Aquanet. We gave him that 80s big hair. It was amazing. <laughs> Additionally, the ears of several of the animals had started to decay over time. There were small piles of dust below each mount. And especially our leopard had started to fade in the sunlight. As these animals are kept up year-round, we never put them in storage. So they are constantly exposed to UV light. So our uh, taxidermist was so talented as to freshen up all of these spots, darken up those colors, and really bring these animals back to life. A fun fact. If you can see it, I'm not sure, but on these before images, you will notice the mouth of this big cat has turned green. Over time, all of the mouths of the animals slowly turned green. So a part of the restoration was to return them to their natural color, which is pink and very cute. <laughs> but one animal was not. Its green mouth remains to this day. And that is our terrifying, big-mouthed, green-tongued baboon. So the next time you are in our museum, please keep your eye out for our friend and smile when you see his green tongue. <laughs> Just like the animals in our bank have aged and changed over time, so too have our customers and our customers' needs. In the 1950s, we began a decade-long $100,000 remodeling effort. We removed the massive metal cages that were once vital to the protection of our tellers and opened the bank to a true open floor plan as those of the Prairie School style of architecture would have wanted. We updated our customer lounge, our second floor mezzanine, we got new drapes and new clocks, and of course we added drive up Banking. In the advent of drive-up banking, we saw a massive influx of customers. Our customers had changed their habits. They had grown. They no longer wanted to join and meet our tellers in person, have conversations, and hang out in our massive community rooms. So we built a drive through bank, and very quickly we realized we needed to expand. So we grew to a seven-lane drive-through bank. 
and technology continues to progress, and now we find ourselves with a relatively dormant drive through <laughs> bank. <laughs> As our customers' wants, needs, and desires have adapted and changed, they have now embraced a digital world. We have embraced online banking, and we have mobile banking, and the whole nine yards. And as we changed and met our customers where they were, they thanked us and they rewarded us with business, and we continued to grow throughout our community. We added two locations, thanks to a merger with Town & Country State Bank, adding a location on our east end and on our west end, and we continued to thrive and flourish. So we expanded further into Minnesota, out into Wabasha, and then Kellogg, before crossing the river to Altoona and Holman, Wisconsin. And this brings us to today. Thank you all again for coming. I really appreciate it, and I hope you have a wonderful rest of your evening. Get outside and enjoy this wonderful spring weather.